I'm Rick Edelman, and this is The Truth About Money. On today's show, did you marry Rich? No. <laughs> Saving is probably the biggest mistake investors make today. They don't save enough money. The difference between financial planning and wishful thinking is the reality of the equation. That's all coming up right here, right now, on The Truth About Money. Which feels worse, taking all of your money and losing 1% of it, or taking 1% of your money and losing all of it? This is called mental accounting. Different people have different attitudes. Let's see what folks on the street had to say about it. Wow, that is a tricky question. It feels better for me to say I lost 1% of my total. Psychologically, I don't know. I, 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 I... Well, actually, if you're willing to put money up at risk, then the answer is you better put it up at risk and not count on it at all. All, I just lost all my money, and probably the former, 100% of that investment. I would feel fine. You know, I wouldn't do anything like that at my age. I think losing 1% of, of, of my 100%, I think. Yeah. I can't manage my own money whatsoever. I'm like living paycheck to paycheck because I just like to bankrupt myself. Especially when you're dealing with uh, like, you know, family, maybe with somebody else's money that you lost or something. You know, it's good to justify, oh, I only lost 1% of it. Like, oh, I lost 1%, like that's nothing. Even though it's the same amount, it just feels better coming out of your mouth. If you're going to lose 100% of 1% and to lose it all and say, I'm done with it. It's interesting, isn't it? Different people have different opinions, but it shouldn't make any difference at all. It's straight math. It's pure economics. The fact is, either way, you've lost 1%. But one of them definitely feels worse than the other, and that is called mental accounting. And mental accounting makes people do weird things with their money. Here's one famous story. A husband and wife go out to Vegas, and the first night they're there, they go to a casino, and they lose everything. So they go back up to their hotel room, and while the wife's in the shower, the husband starts to undress, and a $5 chip falls out of his pocket. Well, he looks at the chip, and he figures, what the heck? So he goes back down to the casino, walks up to the roulette table, and bets it on 17 black. And it wins. The odds are 36 to 1, so now he's got $180, and he decides to let it ride. And he wins again. Now he's got over $6,000, and he lets it ride again, and he wins again. Now he's got almost a quarter of a million dollars, and believe it or not, he lets it ride. And again, he wins. Now he's got $8.4 million, and he lets it ride one more time. This time it comes up red 12, and he loses the whole thing. So he goes back up to his hotel room where his wife is waiting for him. She asks, where'd you go? And he says, I went back down to the casino. And she asks, well, how'd you do? And he says, not bad, I lost five bucks. That is mental accounting. And mental accounting causes people to do dumb things with their money. Like, do you have credit card debt and money in the bank? Having money in the bank might make you feel better, but it's dumb if you also have credit card debt. After all, that credit card might be costing you 18% in interest, and you're probably only earning maybe 1% in the bank. But when I tell people to take the money out of the bank and pay off the credit cards, you know what they say? They say, Rick, if I do that, I won't have any money. <laughs> they don't have any money now, they just don't know it. And that's what happens when you suffer from mental accounting. What mistakes are you making because of mental accounting? Do you have too much money in one investment and not enough in another? When you shop, do you focus on how much money you save because an item's on sale instead of how much money you're really spending? Beware mental accounting because it can cause you to make big financial mistakes. I'll bet you have retirement questions. A lot of people do. Take a look at this segment from a seminar I recently produced. Here's some Q&A with the audience. Good evening, my name is Carol and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Just a quick question. My husband and I are fairly early in our plans for retirement and we don't have children yet. We think we're doing all the right things. We have 401ks and IRAs. 
What else should we do so that we can enjoy the ride to retirement, but have enough for when we get there? First thing you gotta do is figure out where is it do you wanna go? I mean, picture a road map, okay? When we look at a road map, we, do, we look at two spots on that map, right? We look at where we are and where we wanna go, and then we figure out a game plan to get us there. And that's what financial planning is all about. It's really that simple. You know where you are, now you need to ask yourself a simple question, where do you want to go? And I'll ask you two simple questions which really represent the entire universe of financial planning. When do you want to retire? And how much income do you want at that time? In today's dollars. As early as possible and as much as possible. <laughs> How long have you been married? <laughs> Three years. Three years. Did you marry rich? No. No. <laughs> um, okay, well, the difference between financial planning and wishful thinking is the reality of the equation. So although you want to retire as soon as possible on as much as possible, Let's put numbers to them both. And it's perfectly fine for you to say to me, I want to retire in five years on 100 grand a year. That's perfectly fine. That's a target destination. Now what we can do is take a look at your current assets. How much money do you have currently saved? And how much money are you adding to that on a monthly basis? Now we'll project how much it's going to earn on an annual basis over the next five years, and is it gonna be enough of a piggy bank to generate $100,000 a year for the rest of your life? Do you think it will? Probably not. Probably not, which means we need to adjust those two goals. We either need to take the five years out to 10 years, or the 100 grand down to 80 grand, or maybe a little bit of both. And that's what the financial planning process is, to figure out what's the soonest I can indeed retire on a minimally acceptable level of annual income. And any good financial advisor is capable of doing that for you. And that's what most advisors in this country do, is help their clients figure out how to get where they want to go. Because most people, although they don't state it as boldly as you did, really do feel the way you feel. <laughs> and they just figure it can't happen and they don't even bother to try. The real news is, with proper financial planning, you'd be astonished at how accessible the achievement of your goals really, really are. They only require one fundamental action on your part, and that is to start now. My wife and I are new grandparents. Our first grandson's eight months old right now. What sort of investment strategy should we begin with? Should we be looking at setting up a 529 fund for college, trust funds? Where should we start? I'm going to give you two options for saving for your child. One is for college, and the other one is for retirement. For college, um, you can set up a 529 college savings plan, which is without a doubt the best way to save for college. You as the grandparent can do this without having to worry about what the parents are doing or the other set of grandparents, because 529 plans can be established by anybody for anybody, which is really terrific. And you set it up, you're the owner of the account, you set it up for your grandchild. Because you're setting up the account and you're the owner of the account, you retain full control over it. Which means in the future, if you decide you don't like the little kid, <laughs> you don't have to give him the money. You can transfer it to another grandchild in the family. You can even take it back and go to college yourself. There are a lot of schools that do these adult education stuff, like learning ex excursions to the Great Pyramids. You can do anything you want to do with the money. And ideally, if you do use the money for your child, then, uh, or for the grandchild, then you can use this money on a tax-free basis. There is no other vehicle that allows you to invest an unlimited amount of money virtually, hundreds of thousands of dollars, all of it growing on a completely tax-free basis. You can, eat, eat, you can do it with $25 too, so anyone can do this with any dollar amount for any child, and the money grows tax-free if it's used for college, and it can be used for any college in the country for virtually any college expense. Not just tuition, but also room and board. Even books and computers, pretty much everything except travel. In fact, you can even use it at colleges all over the world, as long as they're accredited institutions. 
So it works out really, really well. And in fact, as I said, if the kid ends up not needing the money, say they don't go to college, or they win scholarships and grants and don't need your money, you leave the money in the account for other children in the family, or leave it there for that grandchild's grandchild. And you can now have multi-generational growth of the asset. Nowhere else can you do this but in a 529 college savings plan. So it's an ideal way to save for college. Now, interestingly, I'll take it a step further, and perhaps you should consider saving not for the child's college, but for the child's retirement. How bizarre a concept is that? But think about it. If you set aside $5,000 right now for a newborn and let it grow, not for 18 years for college, but for 65 years for retirement, you can amass hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars, through tax-deferred growth. And it enables you to set money aside for a grandchild who, in 65 years old, will remember their grandfather fondly. <laughs> Thanks very Good. much. Let's see how much you know about personal finance. Here's our Truth About Money quiz of the day. Your biggest financial asset is your house, your health, your ability to produce an income, or your company pension or retirement plan. Yes, financial advisors everywhere agree, I have a face for radio. I've got proof, too. Let's take a look at a segment from my weekly radio show. Off to Nikki. She's in Lakewood, Florida. Nikki, welcome to The Rick Edelman Show. Thank you. Uh, we recently refinanced our mortgage. Uh, as a result, we've been getting numerous uh, offers from companies, insurance companies, to have a life insurance policy right. to... To pay, pay off, off. The to pay off that mortgage in case you die, and uh, you want to know whether you should. That's correct. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's really annoying, isn't it, Anderson, that when people get a mortgage, they immediately get that, that name sold to insurance companies who then hire insurance agents and telemarketers to pitch them, hey, we heard you just got a mortgage, so how about buying a life insurance policy to pay that mortgage off if you're hit by a bus? Right. And, and those policies are usually fairly attractive from, a, from an initial sales pitch perspective because you're thinking, wow. Yeah, what would happen if I if I were to pass away? Would my family be able to keep those those payments going? And so by having life insurance specifically for this mortgage, then I'm taken care of. Yeah, it seems like a great sales pitch. But but these policies are declining policies or what we call declining term policies, which means they're as good they're good for as long as you have the mortgage. But the value of that policy goes down because your mortgage is going down. Yeah, you're buying life insurance where the death benefit decreases over time. And if anything, due to inflation, Nikki, you want the benefit to rise over time. The policies are also ridiculously expensive. They're, if, in other words, if you were just to go to buy an ordinary term life policy, you would pay substantially less than to buy a mortgage policy. And I'll give it one final point on this, Nikki, which is really important. If you die... Wouldn't you rather give that money to your spouse and children instead of to the mortgage lender? Definitely. So that's the problem with mortgage insurance is that when you die, the money goes to the mortgage lender. I'd rather give the money to my spouse and let my spouse decide what to do with the cash. Maybe they'll just keep making the regular monthly payments. Maybe they don't have to pay off the mortgage in full. So it's a bad deal. If you need life insurance, and maybe you do, then you should definitely explore with a financial advisor that question. Do you need life insurance? How much life insurance do you need? What kind of life insurance do you need? And let's shop around to make sure that policy is as inexpensive as we can possibly make it. And you'll discover that mortgage life ain't it. It's nothing but a bad sales pitch. Your biggest financial asset is your ability to produce an income. I have a question about exchange-traded funds. I understand that ETFs are cheaper than uh, traditional actively managed mutual funds, but do they perform as well? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs> An exchange-traded fund is a relatively new concept. Many people are not familiar with them. Most of us have heard of mutual funds. Most of us own them. 
Half of all U.S. households own mutual funds. If you have a retirement plan at work, odds are high it offers mutual funds. And most of us are familiar with them. ETFs, however, are relatively new. They've only been around since the 1990s, and most folks are not familiar with them. We're very big fans of ETFs, exchange-traded funds, for one primary reason. They are dramatically lower in cost than ordinary retail mutual funds, as much as 90% cheaper than ordinary mutual funds, which is astonishing when you consider that the average mutual fund in this country charges 3% per year. That's the total all-in cost of the average fund. The average ETF is 3 tenths of a percent per year. The extra 2.7 goes right into your pocket. Now, considering that the S&P 500 stock index has been averaging about 10% a year since 1926, according to Ibbotson Associates, think about it. If it's earning 10% a year and you're paying 3% in fees, that's a 30% cut. When's the last time you tipped a waiter 30%? It's astonishing how expensive mutual funds are. We believe that the primary reason mutual funds are so expensive is because they don't show you the fees on your statement. You ever notice that? Your statement shows you the number of shares you own, the share price, the share balance, but it doesn't tell you the fee that you're paying. To find out, you've got to read the prospectus. Who here's ever done that? <laughs> oh, you're lying. <laughs> Even if you do read the prospectus, only half the fees are in there. There's a whole other document you've probably never heard of called the SAI, the Statement of Additional Information, which is about this thick, typically 150 pages long, which lists another whole set of fees that the prospectus doesn't even talk about. All in, about 3% a year. So we are really big fans of ETFs, but it raises the question by some folks, are they as good as mutual funds? Are they as safe as mutual funds? And here's the good news. From a construction perspective, an ETF and a mutual fund are identical. They're both glasses. And as glasses, they can both hold liquid. They can both hold the same liquid. The only difference is the cost of the glass. There are a few other nuances as well, tax implications and some others, which, by the way, favor ETFs as well. But the bottom line is, if you enjoy mutual funds, you'll enjoy ETFs that much more because they're so much less expensive. I'm happy to welcome to the program Maria Bartiromo, host of CNBC's Closing Bell and host of the Wall Street Journal Report. Maria has written several books, including her latest, The Weekend That Changed Wall Street, an eyewitness account. Maria joins us from the NASDAQ market site in New York's Times Square. Maria, welcome to The Truth About Money. Maria, you're as plugged in as anybody when it comes to what's going on in the economy and the markets and the overall financial situation, reporting on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. But not everybody who's a mere mortal in this country gets to spend as much time as you do with focusing on what's going on. And as a result, when ordinary folks just get the snippets of the headlines, it can seem pretty scary. How should people be responding to their fears? It is scary. And of course, over the last 10 years, we've seen something of a lost decade when it comes to the market because uh, people watch the value of their homes decline and they watch the values of their 401k decline. The truth is, is uh, it takes work and you need to truly study the market every day and watch the market every day to make informed investment decisions. You know, I would say for the average investor, you have to recognize that over time, I'm not talking about two years, three years, even 10 years, but over time, 20 20 years and beyond, the stock market has uh, yielded the best results in terms of uh, in terms of returns out of any asset class. Having said that, nothing goes up in a straight line, and I think in order to truly have a smart investing and saving strategy for the long time, you want to have a diversified portfolio. But I also think that it's very important to have a long-term investing strategy and get your arms around your own financial life because. The truth is the onus is on you uh, to make responsible decisions given that there is an information overload. We're swimming in information all the time. Maria, you and I have both been covering the financial markets and been involved in what's going on for, for 20 years or more. 
and things have changed dramatically. I remember back in the 1980s, there was very little information available. It was just a couple of magazines and, and Louis Rukeyser on public television. And there was really no other outlet for consumers to get information about what was going on in the financial markets. That's obviously changed with 24-7 programming. But has there been a negative side effect to this, where we now have a difference between providing financial information versus financial noise? Tell me what you think about the difference between information and noise and what consumers ought to do about that. I think today it's even worse than it was 10 years ago in terms of the noise out there. There are very important things that relate to your money matters and then there is also noise out there. The onus is on you, the individual, to sift through that. The truth is, once again, it brings us back to fundamentals. Does this make sense? I think these are the very important questions that investors need to ask. What are the earnings? What, are, what is the revenue? Does management own the stock? Do they have a stake in it? What are the products that the company makes? Does the product appeal to people? And is the company growing? These are all very basic questions, but along the way during bubbles and, and booms and busts, we seem to, seem to forget the very fundamental issues. You know, Maria, there never used to be anything called a hedge fund, and let alone institutional investors, the pension funds, endowments, and foundations. Can the little guy compete against the big guys when it comes to succeeding with their investments? I think they absolutely can compete. I think today you have an explosion of information and probably the first trend that I as a financial journalist really experienced along my career is the empowerment of the individual investor. Yeah, I think individuals can do it, but it takes work, it takes study, but it certainly is there uh, for an individual in terms of uh, data, in terms of the explosion of business information, in terms of asset classes. The good news is, is that in Investors today can invest like the pros. Maria, you talk often with some of the most successful, powerful people on Wall Street, and yet I've heard you say often that one of the most important pieces of investment advice you've ever gotten was given to you by your mother. That's right. My mother taught me when I was a very young girl, and I have taken this with me my entire career, and that is saving. Saving is probably the biggest mistake investors make today. They don't save enough money. I'm a big saver from when I was a young girl, and I continue to be a saver today. The first check you should make out when you get paid every two weeks or every week, whatever your pay period is, is a check to yourself. And that should go into your savings account. Now, you're not always going to be able to save the same amount every week or every two weeks. Oftentimes we have bills that are higher than the last pay period. Sometimes we have new expenses. It's okay as long as you save something every pay period. And I don't care if it's $25, if it's $500, $1,000. Every pay period, pay yourself first. You need that wiggle room, you need that nest egg, as we have all just witnessed from the financial crisis. Savings and having a reserve fund is critical. Maria Bartiromo, CNBC host of The Closing Bell, thank you so much for being with us today on The Truth About Money. Thank you, Rick. It was a pleasure. It's so nice to speak with you. And now before we go, which is worse, losing out on a vacation that you have to cancel or suffering a disability that prevents you from being able to work? Well, of course, the disability is worse, but people are far more likely to buy vacation insurance than disability insurance. If you lose a vacation, you incur a couple of weeks of annoyance, but if you get disabled, you could find yourself with a lifetime of financial struggle. Do some financial planning today before you get disabled and before you go on that next vacation. That's the truth about money. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for being with us.